The Chemical Wedding of Christian Rosenkreutz, The Second Day As soon as I had left my hermitage and reached the forest, it seemed to me as if the whole heavens and all the elements were already decked out for this wedding. For even the birds, I thought, sang more sweetly than usual, and the young fawns gambled around so happily that my old heart was warmed. And, moved to song, I began to sing loudly. Dear little bird, rejoice, and loudly praise your maker. Let your voice ring bright and clear. Your God is high above. He has prepared for you your food, and gives it in good season. So therefore be contented. Why should you be sorrowful? Why should you rail at God? Because he has made you just a bird. Don't let it turn your head. If he has not made you a man, be still. He has done well thereby. So therefore be contented. How should I do, poor earthworm, to argue with my God, as if I had the power to fight the very storm of heaven? God will be resisted thus. Let him who thinks not so be God. Man, therefore, be contented. That he has not made you the king should be no pain to you. Perhaps you took his name in vain. He is aware of this. The eyes of God are sharp and keen. He sees your heart. Thus God is not deceived. I sang the song with all my heart so that it resounded through the forest, and the last words echoed back to me from the mountain. Until at length I caught sight of a pleasant green meadow and stepped out of the forest. On this meadow stood three tall and splendid cedar trees, which were so broad as to cast a lovely welcome shadow. I was delighted by this, for although I had not come far, my great yearning was making me exhausted. So I hurried up to the trees to rest a little beneath them. As I approached, I perceived a tablet fastened to one of the trees. After a while, I read on it the following words, written in elegant script. Hail, guest! If you should have heard the news of the king's wedding, then hearken to these words. The bridegroom bids us offer you the choice of four paths, by all of which you may reach the royal castle, if you do not fall by the wayside. The first is short but perilous. It will lead you through rocky places, from which you may scarcely escape. The second is longer, and it will lead you not downwards, but round and round. It is flat and easy, so long as you have the aid of a magnet, and do not let yourself be diverted to right or left. The third is truly the royal way, which will make your journey delightful, with various pleasures and spectacles. But hitherto scarcely one in a thousand has achieved it. By the fourth way, no man may come to the kingdom, for it is a consuming path, and suited only to incorruptible bodies. Choose now which of the three you wish, and be constant thereon. But know that, whichever you have taken, it is destined to you by immutable fate, and you may go back on it only at the greatest peril of your life. This is what we would have you know. But hearken to this warning. You do not know how much danger you incur on this way. If you are guilty of the slightest offence against the laws of our king, I beseech you to turn back while you may, and return swiftly home by the way you came. As soon as I had read this inscription, all my joy left me again, and I, who had been singing so cheerfully up to now, began to weep bitterly. I could see clearly the three paths before me 
I knew that I would be allowed to choose one of them when the time came. But I was afraid that I would hit upon the rocky and craggy path and fall to a miserable death. Or if the long path were my lot, I would either lose my way or be left behind on the long journey. Of course, I could not hope to be the one in a thousand who chooses the royal way. I could also see the fourth path before me, but it was surrounded by such fire and vapour that I dared not even venture near it. So I reflected in my mind whether I should turn back or choose one of the paths for myself. I was painfully aware of my unworthiness, but I comforted myself with the dream in which I had been rescued from the tower. At the same time, I felt I should not let a mere dream make me complacent. And so, my thoughts went round and round, until in my great weariness, my belly cried out from hunger and thirst. So I drew out my bread and cut it up. Just then, I saw a snow-white dove perched on a tree, which I had not noticed before. It fluttered down quite naturally, as perhaps it was used to doing, and approached me without fear. I gladly offered it a share of my food, which it accepted, cheering me somewhat with its beauty. But as soon as a dove's enemy, a black raven, spied it, it hurtled down upon the dove, taking no notice of me, and tried to seize its food, so that the dove's only defence lay in flight. The two birds both flew off to the south, which so angered and troubled me that I hurried thoughtlessly after the evil raven, unintentionally running a nearly a field's length along one of the paths, driving off the raven and freeing the dove. Immediately, I realised how thoughtlessly I had acted. I had already taken one of the paths, and now I dared I could not go back in it for fear of terrible reprisals. To some extent I could put up with that, but I was most upset to have left my bag and bread behind by the tree and to be unable to fetch them. For no sooner did I turn around than a powerful gale met me and blew me over. Yet when I went forward on the path, I felt nothing at all. This was enough to convince me that it would cost me my life to try to oppose the wind. So I patiently took up my cross, got to my feet, and determined to do my utmost to reach the goal before nightfall. There appeared to be many byways, but thanks to my compass I avoided them. I turned not a foot's breadth from the meridian, although the path was sometimes so rough and unkempt that I was quite unsure of it. On the way, I thought constantly of the dove and the raven, but could not fathom their meaning. Finally, I spied from a distance, on a high mountain, a splendid portal. I hastened towards this, although it lay distant and far from the path, because the sun had already sunk behind the mountains, and I could see no other refuge. All this I attributed solely to God, who could very well have let me continue on my way, and could have shielded my eyes so that I would have missed this gate. So I hurried on, as I said, with all speed, and reached the gate while there was still daylight enough to see it. It was an altogether fair and royal portal, carved with many wonderful images and objects, each of which, as I later discovered, had its peculiar meaning. At the top was a largish tablet with the inscription, Away, away from here, profane ones, and other things which it is strictly forbidden me to tell. As soon as I stepped beneath it, out came a porter clothed in sky blue. I gave him a friendly greeting which he returned. Then he immediately demanded my letter of invitation. 
Oh, how glad I was that I had brought it with me, for easily I might have forgotten it, as it indeed happened to others, so he told me. I quickly drew it out, and he was not only satisfied, but to my amazement showed me great respect, saying, Go ahead, my brother, you are my welcome guest. Then he asked my name, and I answered that I was a brother of the Red Rose Cross. He was both surprised and delighted. Then he went on. My brother, have you nothing with you to exchange for a token? I replied that my means were scanty, but if he liked anything that I had with me, he was welcome to it. He requested my small water bottle and gave me in exchange a golden token on which was nothing but the two letters S.C. Sanctitate Constantia Sponsus Carus Spes Caritas Constant in holiness Beloved husband Hope and charity The porter asked me that if this should become useful I would remember him Thereupon I asked him how many had gone in before me, which he also told me. Finally gave me, out of friendship, a sealed note for the second porter. As I tied a little longer with him, night fell. A great pan of pitch was lit above the gate, so that if anyone was still on the way, they could hasten towards it. But the road that led on to the castle was closed on both sides by high walls and planted with all sorts of beautiful fruit trees. On every third tree, lanterns were hung, which had been lit by a beautiful maiden, dressed likewise in blue, with a bright torch. It was so splendid and artistic to behold that I lingered more than I should have. But, eventually... After I had learned enough and received useful advice from him, I took friendly leave of the first porter. As I continued, I would have loved to know what my letter said, but since I could expect nothing unfriendly of the porter, I had to repress my curiosity and put the path behind me until I came to the second portal. This was almost identical to the first one, only with different images and decorations of mysterious meaning. The tablet attached to it read, Give, and it shall be given to you. Beneath this portal, a frightful lion lay chained, which immediately jumped up when it saw me and came at me with a loud roar. Thereupon the second porter, who had been lying on a slab of marble, awoke and told me not to fear or fret. He drove the lion behind him and took the note, which I reached out to him with a trembling hand, read it and spoke with great reverence. Now, by God's grace, is come the man whom I have long wished to see. He also took out a token and asked me if I could redeem it. Having nothing left but my salt, I offered him that and he accepted it with thanks. Once more, the medal bore only two letters, S, M, Studio Merentis, Sal Humor, Sponso Metendus, Sal Mineralis, Sal Menstrualis. By studying the worthy, humor salt, pledge for the bridegroom, Mineral salt, menstrual salt. Just as I was beginning to speak with this porter, bells began to ring from within the castle. He urged me to hurry, lest all my trouble and labour be in vain, for they were already beginning to extinguish the lights above. So quickly did I obey that in my anxiety I forgot to take leave of the porter. It was high time. For fast as I ran, the maiden was just behind me, and all the lights were going out behind her. 
I could never have found my way if she had not cast some light with her torch. It was all I could do to slip in just as she did. Then the door was slammed so violently that a bit of my coat was caught in it. Naturally, I had to leave it behind, for neither I nor those who were already calling outside the door could persuade the guard to open it again. He swore that he had given the keys to the maiden and that she had taken them with her into the court. Meanwhile, I looked round again at the portal. The whole world has nothing to compare with it for richness. Flanking the door were two columns. On one stood a cheerful statue with the inscription, I congratulate, while the other veiled its face and looked sorrowful, and beneath it was written, I condole. In short, there were such dark and mysterious sayings and images on it that the most learned man on earth could not have expounded them. But if God will permit, I shall soon publish and explain them all. At this portal, I had to give my name again. It was written down as the last one in a small parchment book and delivered with others to the Lord Bridegroom. Then, at last, I was given the proper guest token, a little smaller than the others, but far heavier, in which were the letters S, P, N, Salus per Naturam, Sponsi, Praesentandus, Nuptius. Salvation through nature, to be presented to the bridegroom at the wedding. I was also given a new pair of shoes, since the floor of the castle was inlaid with pure polished marble. My old ones I was to give to one of the poor men who sat beneath the porch in great numbers, but very orderly. So I gave them to an old man. Two pages with torches now led me to a tiny cell, where they told me to sit down on a bench, which I did. They extinguished their torches in two holes in the floor, and went away, leaving me sitting all alone. Soon after, I heard a noise, but saw nothing. It was some men stumbling over me, but since I could not see, I had to put up with it and await what they would do. I soon realised that they were barbers, so I begged them not to push me about so. I would willingly do whatever they wanted. Thereupon they let me go, and one whom I could still not see cut off the hair very neatly around the top of my head, but left my long grey hair in place over my forehead, eyes and ears. In this first encounter, I must admit, I was quite desperate, since they shoved me so hard while I was unable to see. I could only think that God was making me suffer for my curiosity. But now these invisible barbers dutifully gathered up the fallen hair and went off with it, whereupon the two pages returned and laughed heartily at me for having been so frightened. We had scarcely exchanged a few words when someone started ringing a little bell again, which the pages told me was a signal for assembly. They invited me to follow them and lit my way through many passages, doors and spiral stairs as far as a great hall. Inside was a large crowd of guests, emperors, kings, lords and gentlemen, noble and common, rich and poor, and all manner of people, which surprised me greatly, so that I thought to myself, Oh, what a big fool you've been, to let yourself in for such a disagreeable journey. Look, those are people you know very well, and have never thought much of. They are already here, but you, for all your pleading and praying, came in last by the skin of your teeth. This and more the devil put into my head though I did my best to pay attention to the outcome. Meanwhile, my acquaintances spoke to me, now one, now another, saying, Well, well, Brother Rosenkreutz, are you here too? 
Indeed, my brethren, I answered. God's grace has helped me come here too. They found us very laughable, thinking it silly to need God's help for so slight a thing. I had just asked one of them about his journey, for most of them had to climb over the rocks, when some trumpets, none of which we could see, began to summon us to table. They all sat down, each one in whatever place he thought set him above the others. I and a few other poor souls were scarcely left a room at the lowest table. The two pages entered, and one of them said such a beautiful and uplifting grace as to warm my heart. But a few louts took little notice of this, laughing and winking at each other, biting their hats and similar fooleries. Then the food was brought in, and although not a person was to be seen, everything was managed so well that it seemed as if each guest had his own server. As soon as my clever friends were a little refreshed and the wine had taken away their inhibitions, the boasting began, at which they were very good. One would dare this, another that, while the most useless idiots generally bragged the loudest. When I think about the impossible and preternatural things I heard there, even today I get indignant about it. Finally, they could no longer keep to their places, but one toady would be thrusting himself among the lords here, another there. They boasted of such deeds as neither Samson nor Hercules could have achieved for all their strength. One wanted to relieve Atlas of his burden. Another fetched the three-headed Cerberus out of hell again. In short, each one had his own squadron, and the great lords were so stupid as to believe their pretensions. In the end, the scoundrels got very bold, not caring though a few got their knuckles wrapped with knives, and when one happened to filch a golden chain, they would all bid for it. I saw one who could hear the sound of the heavens, another who could see the platonic ideas, a third would number the atoms of Democritus. Quite a few had discovered perpetual motion. Some seemed to me quite intelligent, but spoiled it by thinking too highly of themselves. Finally, there was one who would have us believe, then and there, that he could see the servants waiting on us and he would have taken his insolence further had not one of the invisible servers dealt him such a blow on his lying mouth that not only he, but many around him, fell silent as mice. What gave me the most satisfaction was that all the people I had any regard for were perfectly quiet in their conduct and made no outcry. But, aware of the lack of understanding, regarded nature's secrets as far too high and themselves as far too low. In this tumult, I was close to ruining the day that had brought me here. It was painful to see how loose and wanton types sat at the table above, while I was not even left in peace in my little corner, but one of these olds called me a fool in Motley. I did not know at the time that there was still one portal to be passed, but thought that I would have to spend the whole wedding thus, mocked, scorned and humiliated. I had never done anything to deserve this, either from the bridegroom or from his bride. In my opinion, he should have found another fool than I to invite to his wedding. One can see from this what discontent this world's iniquities can bring to simple souls but it was actually part of my lameness of which I had dreamt. The general clamour got steadily louder. There were some who boasted of false and spurious visions and wanted to tell us of palpably lying dreams. However, there sat near me a quiet and refined man who spoke now and then of better things. Finally, he said to me, Look, brother, if someone were to come and try to bring such hardened sinners onto the right path, do you think they would listen to him? Certainly not, I replied. Perhaps the world wants to be deceived, said he, and will not listen to those who wish it well. 
Just look at that toady. With what crazy talk and idiotic thoughts he seduces others to him. And that one there who fools people with words of wonder and mystery. Believe me, though, the time will come when all these liars will have the masks ripped from their faces and the whole world will know what swindlers are the people lurk beneath. Then, perhaps, the neglected will be honoured. As he spoke thus, with the clamour becoming worse the longer it went on, there suddenly arose in the hall such a lovely and stately music as I have never heard in my life before. All fell silent in expectation of what would happen next. One could hear every stringed instrument imaginable, playing together with such harmony that I forgot myself and sat transfixed to my neighbour's surprise. This lasted nearly half an hour, during which time none of us spoke a word, for as soon as anyone opened his mouth, something invisible gave it a blow, without his knowing whence it came. I thought that, since we could not see the musicians, I would have liked at least to see all the instruments on which they were playing. After half an hour, this music suddenly ceased, and we saw and heard nothing more. Soon afterwards, there arose from outside the door of the hall a great braying and rumbling of trombones, trumpets and kettle drums, as majestic as if the Roman emperor himself were making his entrance. Then the door opened by itself, and the brass music grew so loud that we could scarcely bear it. At the same time, there came into the hall, as it seemed to me, thousands of little lights, each moving by itself in perfect orderliness, which greatly amazed us. Finally, the same two pages entered the hall, with bright torches, lighting the way for a beautiful virgin, riding on a glorious, gilded, triumphal throne that moved by itself. I thought that she was the same as had formerly lit and extinguished the lights, and that these were her servants whom she had placed by the trees. But now she no longer wear blue, but a shimmering snow-white garment that glittered with pure gold and she was so bright that we could not keep our eyes on her. The two pages were almost the same, though a little less gorgeously dressed. As soon as she reached the middle of the hall and stepped down from her seat, all the little lights bowed to her, and we rose from our benches, though each remained standing in his place. After she had shown us, and we her, all honour and reverence, she began to speak with an enchanting voice. The king who is my gracious lord is now no longer far away, nor is his best beloved bride engaged to be his wedded wife. Already now with great delight they've seen you all arriving here, and now on every one of you they would bestow their favour. They wish most heartily that you may now succeed at every hour, the coming wedding to enjoy, unmixed with grief for any one. Here she bowed courteously again, with all her little lights, and shortly continued. The invitation, as you know, said that none was invited here, who long before has not received proper gifts from God, and who is ignorant of how one should behave in such a place. Therefore, let none of you believe that any one should be so rash to go against this hard demand. You must imagine what it means if you had not been long prepared this wedding to attend. Thus they remain in goodly hope that all things will go well with you. In these hard times what joy it is to see so many gathered here. But mortals are audacious, their unworthiness gives them no pause. Forward they rudely push themselves where they are not invited. That no rogue may do business here, no knave slip in amongst the rest. That all you unhindered may enjoy the wedding undefiled. Tomorrow every one of you upon the balance shall be weighed. Whoever is to light reveals what he would fain forget. 
Any who in this multitude does not possess self-confidence will slip quickly to the side. For if his welcome he outstays, all grace and favour he will lose. Tomorrow he'll be on his way. He whose conscience is pricking him may stay today within the hall until tomorrow he is free. Yet let him not return. But he who knows his worthiness, his servant will lead out of here and show him to his chamber where he may retire and rest himself. The scales are waiting happily. Else will his sleep be hard. Others must content themselves. For he who dares beyond his powers would have done better not to come. We wish you all the best. As soon as she had spoken, she made another reverence and jumped gaily back onto her throne. Thereupon the trumpets began to sound again, but many of us could not suppress a deep sigh. The invisibles led her out again, but most of the little lights remained in the hall, one keeping company with each of us. Our agitation was almost more than I can describe, and fearful thoughts and expressions were exchanged. Most people were still willing to let themselves be weighed, hoping that, if they did not succeed, they might be allowed to depart in peace. I myself had thought it over briefly, and, overwhelmed by awareness of my lack of intelligence and unworthiness, I decided to remain in the hall with the others, doing better to content myself with the meal than to court a perilous failure. After one person here, another there, had been led by his light out into a cell, each to an individual one, as I later learned. Nine of us remained behind, among whom was the man I had spoken to earlier at table. Our lights did not abandon us, but after an hour, one of the pages came in, carrying a great bundle of cords, and asked us earnestly if we were determined to stay there. When we assented with a sigh, he bound each of us to a different place, extinguished our lights from behind, and left us wretches in the dark. Then several of us felt the water o'er our feet. Then several of us felt the water overflowing its banks, and I myself could not restrain my tears. Although we had not been forbidden to talk to one another, pain and disappointment left us all dumb. The cord was so cunningly made that none could cut it, much less extract our feet. I took scant comfort from the thought that so disgrace was awaiting many a one now going to his rest, whereas we could pay for a presumption in a single night. At last, in the midst of my heavy thoughts, I fell asleep. For although only a few of us closed our eyes, for sheer exhaustion, I could not keep mine open. As I slept, I had a dream. And though it may not mean much, I do not think it superfluous to tell it. I dreamt I was standing on a high mountain, and I saw before me a great wide valley containing an innumerable crowd of people. Each one had a thread attached to his head, by which he was suspended from the sky. Some hung high, others low, while a number were practically standing on the ground. An aged man flew around in the air, holding in his hand a pair of shears with which he here and there snipped off a thread. Whoever hung near to the earth landed the sooner and fell without much noise. But when the turn came for the high one, he would fall so as to shake the ground. It happened to some that their threads were so stretched that they came to earth before they were cut. I much enjoyed the spectacle of this tumbling and was heartily amused when one who had soared above his station high in the air crashed ignominiously and even pulled down some of his neighbours. I was just as glad when one who had kept close to the earth all the time was able to land so silently that not even his neighbours noticed. While my entertainment was at its height, one of my fellow prisoners inadvertently jarred me, so that I awoke 
and was very annoyed with him. But I thought over my dream and told it to the brother who lay by me on the other side. He was quite amused and wished that some comfort might be concealed in it. We passed the rest of the night in conversation and impatiently waited the coming day.